Hey friends, welcome back to the channel. Now, when we're trying to build complex software, it's really important that everyone is on the same page. Even though I know most of us prefer to work at home alone with an endless supply of coffee, good software just isn't built that way. The software that you build should represent the business and it should be clear from the code how the business functions. Software development is difficult enough without the business and engineering using different names for the same thing. This is where domain-driven design or DDD for short comes in, which was made popular by Eric Evans in his 2003 book, Domain Driven Design. Design. In this video, I'm going to be covering the key concepts that you need to know to be able to use DDD in your next project. The first step is what we call strategic design. Even though it's possible to use DDD in an existing application, it's much easier when the application is built with it in mind. So we need to work out what the different subdomains are in the business. A domain in this case refers to the subject area on which we're building the application, and subdomains are a part of that application. It's really important when you're working out the subdomains that everyone is using the same language. You want the words that you use to describe objects in your application to be the same ones that are used by the business. This has the grand name of ubiquitous language, which is really just a fancy way of saying everyone needs to use the same words. So let's use Netflix as an example. If we were to build Netflix from scratch using DDD, what subdomains would we have? So obviously we have video streaming, which is one of the main parts of the business. And therefore this is what we call a core domain. And then we might have recommendations as another subdomain and maybe billing, which handles all of the subscriptions. There are of course gonna be quite a few other domains that we haven't covered here, but this will give you an idea of how DDD works. Now working out what the subdomains are should always be done as a group exercise with the business. If the engineering team tries to work out what all of the subdomains are themselves, then it might not be representative of the business, which kind of defeats the whole point of domain driven design. The aim here is to end up with a system that represents the real world domain that you're trying to solve. Working out all the domains is going to be an iterative process. You might find that one of the domains is huge and needs to be broken down further. Once you've worked out what all the domains are, the next step is to work out the key parts of each of those domains. If we take a closer look at the billing domain, we'll probably find inside we'll have things like subscribers, accounts, payment details, and subscription plans. What you'll notice when you go through this exercise is there'll be parts that will be common across multiple subdomains. For example, the subscribers will likely come up across the whole system. The billing domain might call them subscribers or maybe even customers, whereas the streaming domain is more likely to call them viewers. DDD copes with this by what is called a bounded context. Each subdomain will have its own bounded context, allowing the language to be used to be different for each of the subdomains. You don't need to get the whole business to agree on what to call subscribers. You just need to agree on what to call them in each of the subdomains. If you've done a good job, you should find some clear separation between the different subdomains and the language used. Each subdomain should have at least a few things that are unique to just that domain. For example, the billing domain will likely have payment details, which you wouldn't expect to see in any of the other domains. The aim here is to build up a model of all the different elements that make up each of the domains. These elements are what we call entities, which we'll cover in a bit more detail in a minute. If you're liking this video so far, you might like my weekly newsletter, The Curious Engineer, where I cover everything you need to know to level up as a software developer. I've added a link in the description so you can check it out. So now that we know what all the different subdomains are, our next step is to work out what the relationships are between them. We do this by by creating what we call a context map, which outlines which domains communicate with each other, how they communicate, and the direction that they're communicating in. The interactions between the different subdomains will usually happen between the different entities. Now, if we go back to the Netflix example, the video streaming domain is going to need to know what quality of video to show to the viewers. This, of course, all depends on the subscription that they're paying for. If they're a basic user, then they'll get HD, if they're a standard user, they'll get full HD. And if they're a premium user, they'll get ultra HD. The subscription plan, however, is outside the bounded context of the streaming domain. It doesn't care what users are paying. It only cares about streaming videos. The streaming domain therefore needs to check with the billing domain to work out what quality video to show to the user. Of course, the billing domain doesn't care about video quality. It only cares about the subscription plans. So we need to do a mapping between the viewer in the streaming domain and the subscriber in the billing domain. Now, to make sure that we don't pollute either of the domains with information that doesn't need to be there, we create what we call an anti-corruption layer, which does the translation between the domains for us. Once we have outlined all the domains and how they interact, we go on to the next step, which is tactical design. In this stage, we look at trying to refine our domain models a little bit further. To do this, we look at each of our domains and try and work out what the objects are inside them. Now, domain objects come in two forms. So first we have entities, the entities of a domain linked to their real world counterparts. So in our Netflix example, we might have subscribers as one of our entities. Each entity has an ID and it's this ID that makes them unique. If all the other properties are exactly the same, if the IDs are different, they're considered different entities. 
Entities are mutable. You can change their properties over time. For example, a subscriber might change their email address, but if the ID stays the same, it's still considered the same subscriber. The other domain object to consider are what we call value objects. A value object, as the name suggests, generally corresponds to a value in your domain. Entities can have several different value objects in them. For example, a subscriber is likely to have an email address as well as a date of birth. Value objects are not unique, and two objects with the same value are considered to be equal. If you're creating value objects in C Sharp or Java, then you're going to need to override the equals and hash code methods. This ensures that when you compare them in your code, the computer knows that they're equal. Unlike entities, value objects are immutable. You can't update them, and if you need a different value, then you just need to create a new one. We generally do this by only allowing values to be set in the constructor when the object's created, and then we don't set up any setter methods to allow you to update them. The key thing to understand here is they are an object. You could just as easily create a string to store the email address, but by creating a value object, you're explicitly stating that this is an important part of your domain. The fact that it's an object means you can add additional validation and business logic into the constructor. This can be really useful. For example, if you have an email address object, you don't need to check everywhere in your code that you have a valid email address, as that would have been done when it was created. Even if you don't end up using domain-driven design, value objects can be really useful for writing cleaner code in your applications. When modeling your object, it can be difficult to decide whether something should be an entity or a value object. Generally, it depends on how important that object is in your domain model. For example, in many domains, an address is just information. It may be included in the billing details, but it doesn't actually have any importance in the system beyond that. Now imagine you're creating a real estate application. Now the address isn't just information, it's an important part of understanding the property. In this case, the address would more likely be an entity than it would be a value object. Generally, you want to have more value objects than entities in your domain, as value objects are small and immutable, which makes them easier to work with. Now that we know about entities and value objects, the next important thing you need to know in DDD is called an aggregate. An aggregate, as the name suggests, is a group of several entities and value objects. An example could be a customer's order. It's made up of the customer, the products they ordered, the order price, as well as information such as the shipping address. An aggregate also makes up a transactional boundary. So whenever changes are made to the aggregate, they should be either committed or rolled back to the database. This way we can ensure that the aggregate is always in a consistent state. Like entities, aggregates also have an ID, which means they can be referenced from different parts of the application. The aggregate is also responsible for maintaining business invariants. These are just business rules that always remain true no matter what you do to your system. For example, you might have a rule that says the order total needs to be a sum of all the products ordered. You might have another rule that stops people from ordering more than what is in stock. Obviously, all of this comes at a cost. The more rules that you add into an aggregate, the longer it's going to take to update it, which could affect user experience. So generally, there is a bit of a trade-off between performance and consistency that you need to keep in mind. In some cases, it might make more sense to set up what we call a corrective policy that runs on a regular basis to either flag or correct anything that might be wrong. Finally, we have repositories and services, which if you've done any backend development, you're going to be familiar with. The repositories in this case are the persistence layer for our aggregates so that they can be stored in the database. Then we have the services, which contain additional business logic, which either doesn't fit in a single aggregate or spans multiple aggregates. Once you have everything mapped out, you're ready to build your application. One of the best ways to build out a domain-driven application is using hexagonal architecture. And if you haven't already, it's worth watching this video next. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you in the next video.